Welcome back to another episode of City Life Uncensored. As I always am, but you know more so now than ever, really excited to have a, a friend of mine and uh, an actual City Life investor here, right? So a, a passive investor of ours and you know, someone that's been instrumental to, to the city life growth, you know, both on the equity investment side as well as the debt investment side. So, you know, obviously we'll jump into that here later on, but, you know, welcome to the podcast, John. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, really excited to be here. Been a big fan of city life, really, you know, right from when you guys were first uh, getting up and running. So it's been awesome to... Uh, witness your journey through the years and uh, even be a little bit part of it, right, as yeah. a passive Big investor. Big part of it. So, I appreciate yeah. that. I mean, I, it's funny. I'll never forget. We, uh, you know, we met through a college friend of yours and my older brother's Roman where you were actually like the, uh, I, I, I don't know right the right word to give it, but you were the guy that had to come in and see if we were for real at the time, right? Because you're, yeah. you're also an active real estate investor. And so we met at a bar. The uh, corner pub, the corner pub in Lebo, hit yeah. it off, right? I mean, yeah, I was nervous. I was really nervous for that. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, you were nervous, and you know, uh, certainly, you know, limited funds, right? And like, where I invest my money, like it's, uh, you know, I have my family depending on me, right? I, I have to make like some good decisions, so definitely wanted to meet you guys and you know dive deep into like what you do and. Uh, and that's what, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, between, you know, meeting you and Brian, uh, you know, learning about you guys and then seeing the operations, then seeing the numbers, seeing the accounting, uh, that's how I knew, you know, it was a, it was a good decision. You know, it's going to be a good decision. Yeah, appreciate that. Why, don't, why don't we dive into it, right? Because I, I, I'll lead in with this. I mean, I think that that meeting, you know, where we introduced each, we met each other that day, right? And then you know, ongoing for multiple years now, I've continued to always say, you ask the best questions. I remember the Christmas party, even we sat there for like an hour. My job was to like network the entire time. I'm like, nope, I'm right here at the bar hanging out. <laughs> you know, we're you know, shooting the shit, if you will, right? And yeah. Because I always get so much value and education out of the conversation. So why don't, why don't we dive in, right? Like, as we do on the show with everybody, you know, what's the come up? Give us the story, man. Where did you come from? What are you doing? What's the, what's the story? Yeah, I can give you a little background. I mean, I uh, grew up in a small rural town, uh, about an hour and a half, two hours north of Pittsburgh, uh, Sandy Lake, it's called. Shout out Sandy Lake. Yeah, bro. shout out Sandy Lake. Um, then I went to uh, college at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, graduated in 2003, majored in information systems. Uh, my first job was for Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, worked at the corporate office, really? moved out to, uh, Columbus, uh, did, uh, coding development on their point of sale systems. So like the registers, handheld scanners in the store, people counters. Um, I told my, what would it be my wife? I said, like, I met her in Columbus. We lived at the same apartment complex and I, you know, I basically gave her the message early. <laughs> One of those like, things, huh? I'm moving to Pittsburgh. You know, I'm raising my family in Pittsburgh. Um, so to hold true to that, I quit my job at, in Columbus, got married and moved to Pittsburgh basically within all in one month. Wow. Like it all happened at once. I moved back to Pittsburgh, got a job at uh, Bank, of New York, Bank of New York Mellon, worked there for about 10 years from- What'd you do there? Uh, I was in IT, you know, project management, um, technical architecture, you know, things like that. Uh, left there after 10 years, went to a company called SDLC Partners. It's a consulting company. Worked there for maybe a couple years and then went to uh, Amazon, where I'm currently at. I've been there about two and a half years. I'm a technical program manager there. Uh, so working, you know, on the IT side specifically in their fulfillment technologies. So like all the technology that like runs the warehouses. And I say I first got into real estate. I think I- Whoa, 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 bro. What? Hold on. What's that? You just said something. I've got to dive into this. So basically you're in tech at Amazon. Yes. Yeah. G give, me, give me a little bit more. I mean, that's, I mean, listen, right? If you're standing from afar, right? CMU grad, worked your way up, big career. Before we even get into all the success you've had running businesses and- um, you know, real estate investment, right? Like that's a journey, bro. Right. Like an impressive journey. So what, what, just dive a little bit more into that for me. Like how, how it's, 
you know, the journey, but more importantly, right? Like obviously the journey landed you at a big time company like Amazon doing technology at a technology company, right? right. Like what's that been like? What's the, you know, give us the good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a grind and just trying to, you know, like anything like building this company or anything that you're trying to do, you know, just waking up every day, um, working hard, trying to make the right decisions and sticking with it. I mean, there's been highs and lows. Uh, in fact, from when I left BNY Mellon, I was actually uh, let go uh, through a layoff. Oh, wow. Right? So, um, at, at BNY? At, okay. Yeah, from BNY Mellon. So, uh, I mean, you could call it a firing. I mean, it was through like a reduction in force. You know, they did a round of layoffs. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a heck of an experience right there, right? I mean, you're sitting there one day you got a job and it, it kind of, it definitely took me by surprise the next day. Uh, you know, you're unemployed. So it's you had like, no idea. I had no idea what's coming. No, I mean, there was, I don't think it's like worth going into it too much. I mean, it's just a series of unfortunate events that kind of led up to it. Like management changes, my boss left the company, like the way these things work, right. I just got assigned to a brand new manager. He was out of New York. I was in Pittsburgh. I had no relationship with them. And then the managers kind of all go in a room and they go like, you know, we got to have a reduction of force. Who are we going to let go? I was just in a really bad yeah, spot. I, don't know I had dude. no relationship, yeah. you know, so, but ultimately as many things in life, right. Uh, what looks like, you know, something bad ultimately led me down a path that was much better. I think if that wouldn't have happened, I'd probably still be there. Um, instead of at Amazon, right? And the journey to get there and the journey I'm going through at Amazon has, you know, increased my skill set. It's just much more challenging. I'm really happy with where I'm at, right? Great. So these setbacks in life, uh, and, and you know, like many times, like where it looks like a setback is actually setting you on an even mm -hmm. better trajectory. So yeah, I mean, look, right. And you know this about myself, but I was, you know, took a massive pay cut and took a CFO job, right? And it lasted about 10 months before I was fired and look where we're at now. But exactly. I would have never even thought that I could own a company even while I was there, even when I got fired. Exactly. Right? And, and you know, here we are, so. And it just hardens you so much, right? When you go through something like that, you once you go through it, and like anything in life, it's like, uh, you know, these hardships uh, create calluses, yeah. right? And you're just a new person when you come out on the other side and you just keep kind of going through those. It's like a shame the way life works, right? But you have to go through failures. You have to go through hardships to grow. So, you know, let's uh, just try to embrace it when it, when it, when it comes and, and enjoy the good times when you're not going through those hardships. Yeah. So. Right. Um, you know, at, at the, at the Liberty here, a, a risk of, of asking you a question that's dumb. What was the interview process like at Amazon? The interview process was extremely intense. Um, it's known, uh, you know, Amazon's known for a very thorough interview process. Um, you know, it was the, the standard is you go through a loop. There's like, you know, which is you interview with five or six different people the, um, I'm just kind of being careful because I don't want to tell you anything proprietary. Can't tell a trade secret. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to, I, yeah, I really, yeah, I can't tell you any trade secrets, but this is all like public information. Um, the interviews are all, this is, I think a very interesting point that you'll find interesting. The interviews are all based on Amazon's like leadership principles, right? So we have, I've never worked at a company or even known of a company that is driven more by their principles. And like you guys have principles, like you have the Mr. Rogers principle. Yep. And I, I can, yeah, I don't know we, we call them core values, but core same values, concept, right? Our four core values, thing, we live right? and breathe them up every day. And this company, you know, Amazon is so strong, uh, drives their company so strongly through their core values, their leadership principles. I mean, I could recite most of them for you. It starts the hiring process. Each person's assigned like, okay, you're, you know, we ask the typical, what are mostly typical behavioral questions, but we're saying when you when you get the answer for this behavioral question, you need to find out, does this person have this leadership principle and how did wow. they actually demonstrate it? Like some of ours are like, you know, deliver results, insist on the highest standards, earns trust. You know, I could go on and on, mm -hmm. but I think that's the thing that really differentiates Amazon's interviewing process more than anything is that, um, you know, really looking 
to find somebody that has our core values, our leadership principles ingrained in them and has provenly demonstrated those principles in the past. How do you, you know, in your opinion, right? I mean, obviously you're in a significant role at Amazon, right? With, with your career and where you're at. But at the end of the day, Amazon is on as a massive, massive company with, I don't know the number you might, so you can tell me if you do, right? Total employees. So how do, how do you think they can, I mean, obviously, right? You touched on it a little bit, but how do you think you can effectively find that many people that live those, you know, quote unquote, what I would call core values, but those leadership principles, right? I mean, it, it's gotta be difficult, right? I think it's definitely difficult. I mean, they're, to maintain a high hiring standard, it's expensive, right? You have to go through a lot of candidates, right? You have to, I'm sure that they're somehow investing in, you know, bringing the best people to them. I mean, they do have an advantage, you know, the brand awareness, a lot of people, you know, it's one of the big five, you know, the Google, the Amazons, the Apples. Mm -hmm. So they do have that advantage going for them. But, um, you know, part of it is just one of the leadership principles insists on the highest standards, right? Like, they have this structure where, you know, they have like a bar raiser in every interview, like basically somebody that's like an interviewing specialist. They also have like a day job, like a, like me or anybody else, but they have chose to become a bar raiser. There's certain qualifications, extra classes that you have to go through to achieve this standard. They're in every interview loop. They have the ability to, to veto the candidate um, wow. so yeah, just kind of insisting on those, those highest standards and, um, knowing that there's a cost, but knowing that that cost is worth it's it. It's worth right? it, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day yeah. to find people to live the values and the leadership principles that you live. I mean, it's exactly, it's everything, right? Cause talent's one thing, but you know, that's, that's the other massive piece to this. Also. Exactly. You know, two and a half years in, you said best job ever. I better, you better answer that the right way here, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> public, I'm on uh, public record. No, I, I really like, uh, really like my job there. Um, it's just, I like the people, I like the challenges, you know, it's just the problems that we get to solve are really challenging. They're, uh, deal with things on a massive, massive scale. So what you think about would be like a mundane, simple problem or an edge case, you know, when you're dealing with, with the 1% of the 1%, you're talking about, you know, sometimes like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Because they're just so massive, so mm -hmm. global. Um, yeah, it's, so like, it makes, it's like 20 million means nothing. Yeah, exactly. So like, like, and, or just like problems, like, oh, we have like this exception where, you know, we have a problem with the inventory uh, a quarter of a percent of a time. Well, that's like a hundred million dollars problem to go solve, right? So where another company, it might not even like hit the radar, right? And yeah. it's like you're not solving that interesting hard problem because you're just going like it's a corner case, like whatever. Yeah, it's a one off. Who cares? It's a one off, right? But we're so massive, we can go after that corner case, save a ton of money, and I get to solve like a really interesting, intriguing problem. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So I pivot a little bit here, right? I mean, I you know appreciate diving into that a little bit, but I think the really cool part of your story, in my opinion, is you do many things, right? So obviously you have you know the standard corporate job, and you've had it your whole career, which again, you know, kudos to you. It's it's fantastic. I mean, you've done so well to be where you're at, right? CMU grad, you know, kind of climbed your way up the ranks in the IT world, which is fascinating. And I want to get an AI towards the end of this, but hopefully we have some time okay. for that. But um, you know, so now you're crushing it at Amazon, you know, obviously, but you have some other things going on. So why don't you dive a little bit into that for us? Tell us, tell us what else you have going on. Then we can dive into that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, I have, uh, about, you know, 13 rental units that, uh, up until very recently I, uh, managed myself. I, you know, acquired them, you know, probably started in 2009, you know, you know, bought, uh, I didn't do the actual rehab, but like managed mm -hmm. everything, right? Like did hard money loans. Um, so that's, so that's been a kind of a, a, a journey there building my own real estate portfolio. Um, and then we also six years ago, uh, my wife, uh, runs, uh, the day to day, but we own a nothing bunt cakes franchise. We own the one, uh, in upper St. Clair, um, and we're getting ready to open up a second location uh, in the blocks, 
That's like that plaza, like two, maybe like a mile north of Ross Park Mall, right oh, there on great. 19. Yeah. It's like Wahlburgers and Saks Fifth Avenue's in that plaza. So yeah. we're going to be good in there. Do you have a uh, launch date set yet? Uh, yeah. So tentatively, I would say like September, October timeframe. We just uh, started construction last week. So uh, knock on wood, the construction schedule yeah. Uh, holds true. That's when we're targeting to open. Yeah, congratulations. So yeah, obviously, thanks. you know, quick quick shout out to Nothing Bunk Cakes because it's about five minutes from my house and I've certainly had my uh, fair share of growing my belly with it. So <laughs> nice. uh, thank you for that. And um, that's great for the community because I know it does well, right, from just a community standpoint. A lot of people, you know, love that there. I, you know, in the, forget the name of that plaza right there, but where the Whole Foods uh, is in, in South Hills, yeah. right? So I forget the name of it too. It's like, Sienna at St. Clair. Sienna at St. Clair, yeah. yeah, yeah. So why why back in 09, right? Why was why did it make sense for you to invest in real estate? A lot of people yeah. uh, in corporate America decide not to, right? They got stocks, they got this, whatever, they're living their lives. I know you have family, we yeah. can touch on that too, but like why did you decide to just start buying real estate? You know, it's funny. It was a long journey really, and it I remember when I first started at um, Abercrombie, first came out of school, I just had like this uncomfortable feeling of like you know, is this it like nine to five forever? And I didn't know what it was, but I just felt uncomfortable and I felt like there was some answer out there. Right. So I started exploring and I remember it was like a time in my life I was reading a lot of like self-help books, like just trying to figure it out. And, you know, I did. What do you, what do you really think is the root of that? Was it truly like, is this it? Is this my life? This nine to five? Do you think that was it? I think that was I mean, it's hard to just sum it up in words, right? I mean, I, I think if I could sum it up, it was this, this feeling of, un, I would just wasn't comfortable, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. I had this uh, feeling of, yeah, like something's not quite right. Like this, there's something more there. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, right? But this feeling kind of sent me on this, this feeling of uncomfortableness, right? Kind of sent me on this journey to search out, mm -hmm. you know, what, you know, what is kind of missing there and what could maybe kind of fill that, if you will. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like I said, and I tried some other things like, you know, I was like, well, maybe I should be like an independent. This is like when mobile apps were first starting. Like maybe I should be like an independent mobile app developer. I was like messing around with that. It's like trying to start like some e-commerce sites, like just dabbling, right? Like nothing serious. Yeah. Yeah, and, trying to figure out what to do in your your spare time. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah. And just kind of exploring like self-help, you know, like I said, like reading these self-help books. And uh, yeah, I kind of like stumbled upon this idea of real estate. It was like in Columbus still, but it never really got legs. And then I came back to Pittsburgh and like the real tipping point was I basically just cold called uh the guys, I don't know who owns it now, but the franchise, like we buy ugly houses, yeah. right? Yeah, I don't know either, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. okay. And at the time, the owner was uh, an ex uh, CMU alum as well. And he, you know, had me come into his office and we just talked for like an hour, maybe two hours. And he's like telling me about all these things. And then like everything like started clicking, you know what I mean? And like I could kind of start to see how it could all unfold. And then I bought my first house off of them as the, they were the wholesalers, right? And they kind of showed me the whole process of like hard money lending and, you know, how to evaluate a property from like a cash generating machine, right? And you know, that that was kind of like really the spark that like lit me on the real estate, uh, you know, kind of the real estate path. Okay. Let me ask you this question, right? Because I think this is the fundamental concept that everybody needs to hear. What made you do it? So you took action clearly and you bought a house, right? I think people go through their entire lives saying, I'm going to do it and just never do. Yeah. Why do you think you were able to successfully cross that hurdle? I mean, some of it's uh, like my values maybe even started instilled from my parents. I mean, my dad is always instilled in me like, you know, you don't want to be the guy sitting at the bar one day saying, oh, I had an idea like that. I just never did it. Right. Like, you only got one life to live. You got to do it. The second thing is, is you can't be uh, paralysis through analysis, right? Like, yeah, you do. And trust me, like I'm a data guy. I look at the numbers. I look at the facts. But when it comes to 
investing, when it comes to opening a business, you're never going to have enough data that just says like you're 100% guaranteed, right? So you got to get so far and then like you got to just take a leap of faith. I think I shared with you before, it was interesting one time along this leap of faith idea when we opened up the nothing bunt cakes, they have like a big, um, convention every year where all the owners come, uh, to one location and, you know, they do like two or three days of like, se- you know, speaker yeah, exactly. Yeah. Breakout sessions, all that stuff. So I remember the first one I went to, I don't go to uh, all of them, but I did go to the, uh, the first one. And I was thinking like, man, I'm going to like meet like all these like super smart, very sophisticated people, um, these successful business owners. Successful They're, business we, we owners. We have them right? on a these, pedestal, right? Exactly. These yep. guys are going to be like geniuses, right? Uh, I hope I can like live up to it. And like what I found, and there definitely is some, there was some people I met that were like really, you know, I'd say like just kind of like, you know, like high IQ, right? Mm-hmm. Like just really had it together. The majority of like actually the people, and I, and I don't say this as a diss, but I think the most important trait that they had is just the ability to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, and again, I say this, um, I say this with endearment, they were almost too naive to know the risks, I think in some cases, right. Yeah. Uh, where a smarter person would have done the analysis and said, this is too risky. This is too risky for my family. I can't do that. Uh, these people, they just, they just do it. You just, you just do it. And I know. Hey, listen, you could, you could call but, us, you know, and I'll put myself in that category. Yeah. Dumb people that just take action. You just right? do it. Cause that's what we, I mean, we, you know, my brother pretty well, right? Also seeing you graduate and my other brother's an attorney. My parents were attorneys and right. I'm, I am the dumbest in the, in the family. <laughs> right. And it's like, you know, what sets myself apart and why I've been having success or have had success. Right. And to your point, I'm that person, right? And you just do I, it. Don't, I don't take it as a as a um, a non. I take it as a compliment, right? We had the ability or the or the uh, ability to eliminate the the fear, the fear of the unknown, and take action, right? Or you embrace the fear, right? There's always going to be that fear, but you just uh, getting That's comfortable with the yeah. uncomfortable. You know what I mean? That's the thing. Like if you have fear, you can't take that as a sign to not take action. You have to get comfortable being uncomfortable, um, and you can take steps to do that. I think in everything in your life, right. It doesn't have to be just in business or just in real estate, like, you know, working out every day that like makes you uncomfortable or yeah, dude, I hate know, working out, maybe I having have like it. a <laughs> difficult conversation with your spouse or your child. Right. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's one of those things, right? right, bro, where it's like, how do you on a daily basis, take whatever it is that you don't want to do and just make sure you do it and do it anyway. Right. Exactly. Like how do you figure out a way to convince yourself to do that anyway? I think that's what sets, you know, very successful people in their chasing of happiness, a part of people that think that they're happy and just always have the, what if, what if I've done this? What if I would have did this their entire lives? Right. Yep. So why we're real quick. And I want to get back into the real estate, of course, sure. right? you know, many of the listeners are real estate and you know, I'm right, talking real estate, right. so I'm blue yeah. in the face, but why, like, I mean, do you bake? Like, does your wife bake? Like, why, why, uh, uh, yeah, that was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of crazy too. I mean, we weren't even looking to open up a business and we were at like a two day concert in Columbus. My wife and I went there, whatever it would have been six, seven years ago. It was a big country festival, uh, you know, and it was actually the weekend. Are you a big that country the, guy. I like country. I okay. like a lot of genres, but I definitely like country. I go to a lot of country concerts. Um, it was the weekend that the Cavs won the NBA game seven against, they came back from a 3-0 deficit. 3-1 to Golden State. Yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. They were down 3-0, I think. Was it 3-0? Yeah, they were down, yeah, they were down 3-0. And uh, it was that weekend. She's like, oh, you got to try these cakes. I had them when I was traveling in Chicago. She worked at Deloitte. Uh, at the time I was like, sure, I'll try them. And then she's like, wouldn't it be crazy if we opened up one of these? Well, don't you think it would do well in Pittsburgh? And I was like, like I said, there's like, you know, and I, and I've always been kind of be, always had the idea, like, well, it'd be, I'd like to own a business, right? I'd like to be a business owner. And I was what like, year is this? You said seven years ago. So like 20, yeah, I'm saying like, our store's been open six years. So okay. it probably happened. 
15, seven 16, or eight 17. years ago, yeah. something in that time frame. Yeah. You know, that's why I gave you the Cavs reference. So if we could look it up, yeah, I we guess can look at Google it. Google can yeah. always tell look us. Look it up for us. Put, throw um, the thingy on the screen. Yeah, which right. Shows that. <laughs> yeah, right. I forgot we had the we have the um, the we're not, we're not truly editing. live. Yeah, we yeah, right. So uh, so yeah, and like I'm just a type of person that's like you say something, I'm like, yeah, watch, hold my beer, watch this. Right. And I just, it just started like, and I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. You know, I called them and they said like, yeah, we'll talk to you. And it just like, and I, one meeting went to the next and you get more and more data as you go through the cycle. And I just kept vetting the data every time. Right. Like vetting the process. And like, I never found like a thing to say to make me stop. Got it. And we just kind of just kept going. It's kind of crazy. You know, it's just like a snowball that just kind of kept rolling down the hill. And, uh, you know, here we are like opening up. How'd you choose your location? The location, uh, there was the two best locations or, you know, it basically, we chose it based on demographics, population density, average mean income. Right. When we opened up every, uh, they had the territories drawn out, the Nothing But uh, Cakes franchise. Okay. Where you, so you're only allowed certain areas or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um, we just chose, I mean, obviously it was great that it was in the South Hills, close to where we live. We live in Mount Lebanon. But then on top of that, actually like, you know, it's right in that center of like Upper St. Clair, Bethel, and Mount Lebanon. And like that has like, Unbelievably good yeah, I mean, demographics. That's why I said your location density. is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Like that giant eagle right there is like, I don't quote me on this, but I believe it's the highest grossing giant eagle per square footage of like all the giant eagle stores. So it's like obviously. And that's then a you big look, giant like, eagle too. You know, you have like Trader Joe's is there, like all basically all these premium brands. Like they're there for a reason, yeah. right? They're not just randomly throwing darts yeah. at the board. Let's not reinvent the wheel and put our place in a new area where there's nobody. They're, they're there for a reason, Yeah, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. Sometimes it's good to just follow the market leaders, right? Yeah. Um, so how do, how are you, I mean, obviously that's, that's incredible, right? But let's get back to what I love, which is real, real estate. estate. So how are you, you know, obviously you started in 09, you've got 13 active units. You're a, you're a big city life investor. You're in some passive stuff, right? We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to understand a little bit more of how you've been able to hold a full-time job, right? Because we talk so much, right, in, you know, networking events and, you know, people we've had on a podcast, right, and all these different things. And everyone's always pushing be an entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur. You right. got to be on. I've always said, look, like you can be successful by while working through corporate America, having the full-time job and still be an investor, right? So why don't you dive in a little bit more for us? Because I think you're a perfect example of how you've been able to create, you know, real estate wealth actively, invest in real estate, own your own real estate, do it all of yourself. And you had never left corporate America, right? You still are in corporate America. So right. how have you been able to do that? Like it's had to be challenging, right? Yeah. I mean, it's challenging, but I think the key is, is you have to enjoy it. Right. So like when I, I remember like when I'm working on the real estate deal, whether it's, uh, you know, analyzing a deal or working on getting hard money or, um, you know, working through the construction project and getting bids and talking to contractors. I kind of enjoyed every step of that. The thing is, is there's such a life cycle with real estate, right? And you get to meet so many different people, different types of people, interact with them. So I was enjoying it the whole time, right? So I think it's important. And not only that, I had a deep belief in like what I was doing was going to have a really positive result on myself, my family, my financial future, right? So I had both those things, right? So I had the belief that like what I'm doing is worthwhile, it's gonna generate value, and I was enjoying it, right? So now when instead of like, you know, maybe watching a movie or something, it it didn't feel like work when I was putting in a little, some extra time and doing these real estate deals. It felt like, man, I'm learning these new things, I'm interfacing like with these new people. Um, so I think that, so you have to enjoy it. Right. And, uh, I would encourage people, especially if you're going to be an active real estate investor, probably shouldn't force it. If you're going to be now passive, we can talk about it later. Well, real quick, why, to get why, passive, real quick, why don't you, in your eyes, right. Coming from a, a man that's in corporate America to a full-time job, define in your eyes, the difference between an active real estate investor and a passive real estate investor. Well, a passive real estate investor, it's, you know, you're buying into, you know, a syndication, you know, maybe investing in a fund like City Life has, you know, obviously 
you need to put enough time in to do some upfront due diligence on the syndication deal, you know, on your company if you're doing the, you know, the more general uh, fund that you guys offer. But then it's kind of like over, right? And now you've written the check. Now you just kind of monitor the returns and that's it. You're never thinking about anything after that. You know, where I'm, I'm doing everything, right? Like I'm acquiring the house, um, making sure that the, the deal's right. I'm lining up the construction. I'm getting it rented. I was dealing with tenants. So I was dealing with, you know, every facet of the life cycle of, a you know, managing a, a managing property. So yeah, people, people talk difference. about the time, the time all the time, right? We all have an equal amount of time. How are you able to effectively manage your time to even be able to do that? I mean, you're working a full time job, which was, I'm sure, very, you know, you've been, you're a rising star in your career. You probably still are. You probably always have been, right? And you're ambitious in your career. So, how, how the hell did you find the ability to have that time, right? Are you at, you know, properties meeting contractors at 10 p.m. on Tuesdays or like what? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's not ideal, but I'd say, you know, it's not perfect, but like the way you, um, the way I was able to manage it is one, you need a great team, right? So people always say, oh man, you know, you're at a barbecue and you get a call from a tenant, the, the plumbing's screwed up. And I'm like, and like, because of that, I don't want a rental. And because of that, I sold my rental or whatever it might be. And like, my answer mm -hmm. to them is like, dude, like, you know, you're one, you need a good team. Like, okay. I get a text from my tenant. One, I don't panic. I, I go, I have enough thing in the reserve. I have the money to pay for the repairs. You look at it like there's always going to be problems. Like, do you want to solve problems for yourself or do I want to always be prob solving problems for the corporation I'm working for? I Sometimes I just want to solve my own problems, you know what I mean? And, and reap the rewards of it. You're going to be solving problems no matter what you do in life, right? And like some people, it's just too stressful to be solving your own problems. Don't look at it that way. Right. And so, and then, and then it's like, how big of a deal is it really? Like I get a text from the tenant. Okay. Problem with the plumbing. I text, a, a solid, uh, plumber that I have on speed dial, right. That I have a good relationship with that. Um, I treat him with respect. Like uh, the whole, like I said, we're dealing with tons of people. I'm building up good relationships. I'm treating them with respect. They're treating with treating me with respect. You know, when it's time to come together and solve a problem, you know, it's not just me on an island, right? I have a team, just like I'm sure it's city life, right? Like you guys have a, it's, nobody should be on an island. Everybody's like working together. Everybody's on a team. So. Yeah, real quick, just a, just a testament to that. Yeah, our second core value is we got your back, right? Talking earlier about Am Amazon's leadership uh, right. qualities, right? Mm -hmm. It's, we've got your back. We've got to be in this together. So yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah. Teams, everything. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's one of them. Just be comfortable with, you know, fixing your own problems, knowing that you do have problems that you're ultimately going to be accountable for, right? Like nobody else is going to be accountable for that, but you know, just embracing that. And, yeah. uh, and then also being like, now recently I've kind of really went to like, uh, the full management side. And I mean, recently, like within the last 12 months, I've been like slowly kind of trickling these things off when it makes sense, like as a lease ends and they're not going to renew, then I'll, you know, trickle it off to a full property management company. But uh, the other thing is, is just being like really efficient, like with technology, right? Like I have like spreadsheets and Google drives and I had like online forms for them to, you know, fill out applications. And I had, you know, videos that I was posting on YouTube. So I would say, you know, for just somebody managing 10 rentals, as far as like using technology tools and having a process, I was like, you know, really high level. And the event, the nice thing for me, right, is I could like fall back on my core skills on my nine to five, right, where I can, you know, you know, I can see how to build those processes. I have the technical know how to do it. So that helped me a lot too. Yeah. I mean, everything you just said there was such gold. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. The thing that really stuck to me right there is, is the idea that you said of problem solving, right? Because, you know, I've always said this, man, if you can solve problems, you can get anywhere in this world. Yeah. And to your point, right? Like if you're solving your own problems and you're not all like solving other people's problems is going to move you up in this world. When you're solving your own problems, I think the fundamental difference, and I'm going to connect the dots and tell me if I'm wrong, but you didn't really feel like you were working and you found joy and happiness in it. Right? Yeah. So we're going to solve problems all day, every day. Like 
I feel exactly. as though we're pro like make it a problem that you enjoy solving for yourself. And it's going to change the mindset and how you think about it, right? Absolutely. I remember I had a fourth grade teacher, math teacher, Mr. Lewis. Shout out Mr. Lewis. I, 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 God bless him. I don't know where he's at. If he hears me on this podcast, <laughs> that would be that would be something. But he would always tell us, um, you know, the people that can solve problems in this world are the ones that are going to make all the money. I had no idea what he was talking about, but he would say it over and over. And it just stuck in my mind because I remember as a kid, I had no idea what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Now I know exactly what he was talking yeah. about. Right. And, uh, yeah, you're, you, the thing is, if you solve problems for other people, like a corporation, they're essentially making a margin on the, on you. The fact that you've solved that problem for them, there's going to be something left over that they're taking. When you solve your own problems, like you said, it's like great, just the mentality and like you're getting all the mark, like you're getting all the value from solving yeah. that problem. Yeah. So. When you solve it for somebody else, you're getting the education, which will then ultimately get you the ability to move up in the world. When you solve your own problem, you get the same education, but then you also get the result get the of value. The, uh, the value and the result of whatever it is that your problem that you solved. Exactly. Right? And so I, I agree, right? I, I encourage everybody, you need, to, you need to have a side hustle. I don't necessarily believe in pure, pure entrepreneurship or what I did, which was get fired and take a year with no money and no yeah. income and no healthcare, no nothing, right? Like I don't, right. but you can be an entrepreneur. And so be an entrepreneur within your environment, but then find something that you love to do on a daily basis and turn it into your hobby of which then figure out a way to make money from it. Exactly. And like, you know, it's probably worth circling back to, you know, the way you kind of presented the career. Yes, I work diligently in my career, but I've also consciously taken like a different path than some would, right? Like I'm not on a path for the C-suite, mm -hmm. right? Because to get to that path, you are just investing so much time and you cannot get there without just dumping tons of time into it. I took a lot of a different path. Now I've been successful on that path. I've worked hard on that path. I'm happy with where it's taken Is me. Is the company happy as well? The company's absolutely yeah. they're happy. Yeah. Like I'm, a, you know, like I'm an individual contributor. It's just a different path that we're, requires potentially less time, especially as you move kind of like up the ladder on that path. Um, and so like I consciously took about a balance to say, I do want some extra time to do these other things. Like, therefore I'm going to take like a little bit of a different, uh, career tra trajectory, mm -hmm. right. And, uh, like, I don't want to be that C-suite manager. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, how much time you're spending running this company. You couldn't do what you're doing as a C-suite executive, right? And have a side hustle. Correct. And that and that, that's okay. So some of it is is like you got uh there's not there's no magic sauce, right? I mean, sometimes you have to sacrifice over here to make gains over here and uh be comfortable with that, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's I have like, you know, many friends that graduated uh from Carnegie and Mellon that if you look just at their um typical like corporate nine to five career, they've, you know, objectively might look like they've, uh, are at a higher place. I'm like, okay with that. Right. I'm totally comfortable in my own skin because I made that conscious choice because, you know, I have these other things going on over here. It's what I want. Like I'm constructing my life the way I want, you know, I want it to be. I'm not just getting yeah. swept away with these are expectations and this is corporate America. Right. That. I'm consciously have a strategy and I'm like executing on that strategy. Earlier today, I got asked a question. Don't know the exact way it was asked to me, but ultimately, like, how do you define success? And my answer was essentially what you just said, right? Like, what is your ultimate happiness? How can you find whatever that is to you? And it might not be, right, an executive at Amazon, but yeah. it might be some other position at Amazon that's amazing for you where you're not, right, burning the midnight oil every day because you're finding and you've had the ability to get comfortable in your own skin. The only person that can ever solve success for them is themselves, yep. right? And you've been able, it seems right, to be able to really define what that is. And I'm sure it's an ongoing battle forever, right? And it always will be. Absolutely, I mean, you need to work on it. It's like uh, strategy meetings in businesses, right? The business is always correcting its strategy, coming up with new strategies, adjusting its strategies. Same thing with life. You have to have a, like a life strategy, but you don't chart out this 40 year path right? You, you, I mean, you might chart out a 40 year path, but you're reevaluating every step of the way. And it's not always, Oh, how do I get the most money? Or how do I 
do the, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you really need to like look and say like, well, what do you want out of life? Right. And then chart your path like yeah. and get that. Right. Yeah. So that's a, you know, maybe you should take this seat, right? Cause it's a perfect segue into obviously, right? 13 units actively, but I know this and right. So I can kind of lead into this a little bit more. You've obviously moved a little bit more, not totally to some more passive side investment, right? particularly with us and probably some others I don't know. Right. But um, why, right? Like why have you, you know, I think we kind of can, guess a little bit of the answer here in terms of what you just said, but why have you sort of pivoted a little bit and why are you more actively on the, more actively on the passive side, if you right. will, right? Why are you looking to do more deals with other operators and not yourself? I think a lot of it has to do with, um, I've learned, I think as much as I can learn doing it actively myself, right? I mean, wow. uh, not not everything. There's always more. To yeah, work. yeah. No, like, I'm looking the, at it from a different way. The 80 saying 20 rule, yeah, yeah. right? Where and then it's just it started to become not as interesting at night. Not as fun, right? You know what I mean. And now I want to explore other things, right? Like so, the bunt cake uh, business, right? And now we're gonna have like multiple locations, and uh, you know there might be like some other things like around the corner, right? Like, um, you know, uh, it's a like. It's a long journey, right? I'm like 40. Uh, you were gonna think about what's next and tell us, but it sounds like you're not. Yeah, gonna tell well, us. I'm not. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure, right? Yeah. I think about these things all the time, um, but they change all the time. I don't like, and you know, who knows? Sometimes you just kind of fall, and, and then sometimes you fall into something that you didn't even plan, like mm -hmm. the whole. You know, I told you about you know opening the franchise that wasn't even like a long thought out thing. We just kind of fell into it. But if you're always kind of thinking about that. Like when the right opportunity comes along, then you can like recognize it. And that's what happened with the bunt cake, right? Like I'm constantly kind of like looking at these things. And then when the opportunity came, I'm like ready to pounce on it. Right. So, um, that, that I think that's a big reason why I've moved to passive because I'm still like a huge believer in real estate as an investment vehicle, right? Like, you know, the old saying, you know, you get rich in real estate. Like there's a reason why there's that saying because it's true, right? So, um, I mean, there's tons of books you can read about that, right? I mean, just real estate's a great investment tool, right? And so like, how do I continue to leverage that tool but without, you know, investing so much, you know, so much of my time in that area? So, you know, obviously yeah. you wind up heading down the passive route. Yeah, and so obviously you've done that in, in a significant way here with us at City Life. And, mm -hmm. you know, we couldn't be more thankful, you know, for you and your family and friends, right? And, right. you know, you've you've been a massive advocate for us, right? And so, you know, maybe just fluff me up a little bit, right? Yeah, like, what, sure. like, why, man? Like, why us? Why? How's that been for you? What's success? What, you know, are you interested in doing more with us? Like, what's all that look like for you? Yeah, I would say, you know, there's like layers to the decision of like investing with you. Right. So like layer number one is the bedrock of real estate investing is good. Right. We just talked about that. Mm -hmm. Go read a bunch of books. People have, that's well yeah. documented. Yeah. Everybody that's wealthy is invested in real estate in some form or fashion. Exactly. Right. Like, it's, so that's easy. It's okay. well documented. Yep. It's not, it's important to really understand it deeply, I think, and how it all connects, but it's not, I'm, I don't think it's worth explaining it here. There's yeah. just, it's a well proven fact. Then you look at the current economic situation, right. And, uh, I like to think for myself, but I also like to look at who some of the smartest people are and like what they're doing. Look at the institutions like BlackRock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had the opportunity to like work with hedge funds when I worked at BNY Mellon. There's like some of the smartest people in the world working there. They're buying up residential real estate like crazy, right? They're buying up uh, even like single family homes. If they're doing it, there's a reason why they're doing it, right? So I think that just gives... Um, gives strength to like that bedrock of like real estate's a great investment. Uh, you know, it's a great time to be doing it. Like look at like, you know, who's doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, you could look at other economic factors, like why now's a good time as well. And then you go, now it's time to like, okay, well, who are we going to do it with? And um, I think that there's like two facets there. One, it's like, you got to look at the data. So like your syndications that I've been involved in, you look at the deal, you look at the numbers, does it make sense? Um, you know, and then you look at your company. Like when we first invested together, you know, 
I went in as they as I they you know they say I went inside the sausage factory. I wanted to see the blood on the walls. I wanted to see mm -hmm. how the sausage was made. Everything like looked great, right? As far as uh, you know, you're buying great properties. The rehab was top quality. Um, you know, you had a game plan. You're you, you know you had an idea of like uh, the accounting, like all that, right? Like all the eyes and were dotted, the T's were crossed. So then finally for me, and I think, you know, I'm, don't quote me on this, but I believe Warren Buffett does it like this too, where, you know, he invests not just in the company, but he invests in people, right? Like he'll say, I like the numbers that this company has, but on top of that, I love the CEO, right? I, because at the end of the day, he can't be there making the decisions. He's got to trust that somebody at the top of the house is making the right decisions that is like leading this company in the right direction. And like, really that has, you know, you and Brian, right? Like made yeah, a good relationship with you guys it. have a ton of uh, just trust and faith in you guys that you're going to take it in the right direction. So for me, you put all those layers on top and, you know, it becomes like a no brainer. Right? Yeah, no, we, we really appreciate that. I mean, like I said, it's a, you know, the, the journey we've been on together, right, from day one has just been incredible. And you've been such a supporter and, um, you know, more than just a supporter, a, a, a huge base of a referral for us and bringing additional people to us. And, you know, anytime we need to get a word from you to talk to somebody else, you're more than happy to do that and, you know, kind of demonstrate your experience. It's funny, though, right? I'm thinking back to, to the first deal we did. We actually, um, you know, it was really kind of our first, at the time, bigger deal. And it was only a, a, a 12 a 12 unit deal at the time, but we weren't sure how to fund it. Right. And that's when we kind of brought Roman in and, yep. uh, you know, shout out Roman. And he kind of used use his boots on the ground to figure out if it was worth it. Cause he's not in real estate. Right. And so he was going to come in and, you know, like we said, we met at that bar and, uh, you did, man, you really, uh, you saw the blood on the wall. If you, yeah, you asked I a mean, lot of questions. Hey, look, you know, I think, I think that was like, uh, that was like a significant money investment for me too. I think that was like a six figure investment. I want to say, uh, two. Some, I don't know if you want no, to. I can't. I honestly can't remember off the top of my head for some reason exactly. Can I say it? I think. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. it was two hundred. Yeah. No, I think that was maybe two hundred between all three of us, me, Roman, and. Okay. Uh, yeah, so but anyway. But so anyway, then it was then it was six figures. I think it was yeah. a six figure deal, and I'm yeah. you know I mean I'm not going to go. I don't into care like, who it is. It's it, a lot of money, it's right? A lot, it yeah. was a lot of money, and um, for guys you don't really know at the time too. Exactly, and you know I mean like I said I mean it would affect my you know I just couldn't have something like that go south. So I mean not only were you guys is a big deal for you guys, it was a big deal for me. It was certainly the first time I've done like a passive investment, especially of like that size. Uh, I could see a lot of people being uncomfortable and it's weird, you know, again, it's about being getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Like a lot of people are like, even though like you can put your money in the stock market and the stock market can tank, there's like this sense of, um, security in one, like everybody's in the boat together Two, You don't look like an idiot because like nobody's going to fault you for investing in the stock market. But at the same time, you got to be like a free, free thinker and like ready to stand on your uh, successes or mistakes, right? Um, and so, but but I had to get over that hump, right? And that's why I was like doing like a lot of due diligence because it wasn't a it wasn't a trivial amount of money yeah. by any by any means. So like yeah, I mean we we've definitely both been on a journey together. Not only yeah. you as a, like you know me as like and a passive investor, right? Yeah, so. and I'll tell you even even on that deal, right? Like for me, it was the first time we were really bringing in equity capital. It was the first time we were bringing equity mm -hmm. capital before we really knew. And here I am sitting here negotiating with not only just uh, three CMU graduates, <laughs> but three CMU graduates and their attorneys. Yeah. And then it's me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was a tough, I mean, the education I got during that experience, and I, I'll say to this day, from a deal perspective, it was easily the most education I got because the question, I mean, we almost didn't do the deal because we, you know, we were working through so much yep. and it was very new to all of us at the time, right? Other than, I guess, the attorneys, but like, you know, and so we had some, some different, you know, things in the, in the operating agreement, if you will, that w were sticking points on both sides that we had to really work through. So not only was it great education and all those different things, but it was a really good, strong um, ability for us to work through and create a relationship and, you know, learn how to agree to disagree and, and come back to the root of what are we ultimately trying to solve. So I thought that that for me, and I still talk about it, how 
how monumentally valuable that was to to my real estate journey, right? So I appreciate you you for that too. And you know, obviously the the rest is history here, right? And in, in yeah. several equity deals with us now on the syndication side, you were a major player in the, in the debt fund with us. Yep. Um, you know, I've referred several people over to us, and so yeah. um, you know that doesn't it. Um, you know, that trust that you have in us is, is certainly doesn't go uh, to the wayside, man. So really, really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, be, you know, I believe in you guys. That's why I've always been able to been comfortable, like referring, you know, other people uh, to you and to make investments. And I would say I've almost, you know, for different people, I've been a bit of a, you know, I mean, I, I'm not afraid to, you know, tell people, you know, what I think. And like, I, you know, I tell them, you know, you're, if you're investing all your money in the stock market, you're crazy, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'll tell them like, you're crazy, right? Like you got to diversify if you're not taking off in like, we're, you know, and uh, the people I'm talking to, I'm like, you're lucky enough to be in a position that you can diversify. Mm -hmm. I mean, not a lot of people have the funds, even have the funds to invest in a place like city life, right. Or have the wherewithal or the knowledge that you exist, right? The average person doesn't. And so for you to be in a position that you have this opportunity, that's why I say like you have the same opportunity that like BlackRock has, right? Like you're crazy if you don't Mm -hmm. take it. So I would say that to anybody, you know, with the means, it's like, if you're not looking at diversifying your portfolio, and I'm not talking about, you know, buying different stocks, right? Like that's not diversification in my opinion. Um, yeah, I think you're, you're just kind of, you're missing a golden opportunity. Yeah. So that's what I tell people. No. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more, right? I, I don't have money in the stock market just because I'm such a believer in the real estate side. And then, sure. you know, I'm more on the people side, right? So I like investing in people. So we have some, some, uh, passive investments in some businesses now too, right? We're, right. we're, we're zero percent active, but just, um, you know, really like the operator. And so we, we've made some investments there to your point early on around the round of people investment. So we don't have a ton of time left. So I want to ask you one question. Sure. And then I want to pivot a little bit and spend a couple minutes at least on AI, just because you're in tech, I have, and you're at Amazon. And so okay. I have to ask, right? But I'll try. before we get there, and, and it's it's massively the buzz in all of marketing and all of real estate, right? right so we got to bring right. it up. But before I do, you touched on something really early on, and we're we're the biggest believers in Pittsburgh in the entire world, city life, right? And you said early on when you moved out to Columbus and you met your, you know, now wife, you said, I don't, you know, I'm just telling you from day one, I'm moving back to Pittsburgh one day. So yep. you're not from here originally, and you know, obviously you went to CMU here, so you had those ties. But why did why why was that the answer for you even when you were in Columbus? Um, I just love. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, right? But if I had to say one, it's the blue collar roots that this place has, you know, the roots of this place are steel workers, right? The uh, put your hard hat on, go to work every day, grind it out. And I just like the people, you know yeah. what I mean? Like I, every, the people are all approachable. Um, and I can say that like, even in like real estate, right? Like if you go to anybody in Pittsburgh and you show a little bit of humility, hold out your hand, be a little bit um, vulnerable, almost everybody in Pittsburgh is going to help you, right? Successful Absolutely. real estate investors. Let me tell you, you go to Chicago or New York or a lot of cities, it's not like that. They'll be like, get out of here, kid. Really? Right? Yeah, absolutely. You wow. know what I mean? It's like much more cutthroat. Like here, uh, yeah, it's it just comes down to the people yeah. and the culture. I love that. Appreciate you sharing that. Sure. So again, don't have a ton of time, right? And you know, I don't really want to dive all the way into it, but I got to yeah. got to ask you the question, right? And get your your opinion on just general AI and what it is and where it's going. And you're just, I don't know, man. Give me your opinion on it. You know, I don't think anybody knows where it's going. Obviously not a real deep answer, but I think it is a good answer in the extent that you need to constantly be monitoring it. Nobody has the answers yet, right? So I could give you an answer. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. So you need to, everybody needs to constantly be monitoring it. How's it gonna impact my business? If you can't figure out how you're gonna be an industry leader, and use it to impact your business, at the very least, you better be watching your competitors to make sure that they don't get too far ahead of you if they figure out how to use it. Okay. So I would say like, you know, in a short amount of time, that's like the best advice I could give on AI is like, don't think 
you don't know the you nobody knows the answer. Do you do you, you think so you know? Not, alert. And I apologize for cutting you off, sure. here, right? But I'm curious. Do you think if you're not using it in your business today that you're falling behind? It depends on the market, right? I mean, it depends on the industry. If your competitors are using it and using it successfully, then like yes, obviously, right? But uh, I think it'll influence a lot of markets, but like maybe not every market, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like I said, like you just, we talked about it earlier, like strategy, right? Like constantly monitoring and rethinking your strategy. AI is just like another input into that strategy. And unfortunately, it would, maybe it'd be nice just for me to tell you the answer and you can figure it out and put it behind you. But nobody can do that yet. It's just, there's too many unknowns. So we're gonna have to constantly uh, be monitoring not only the technology, but like monitor your competitors too and see maybe, because maybe they'll be first to market with it, right? Yeah. It's not always bad to look and see what your competitors are doing. I love that. Are you uh, actively personally on chat GPT at all? I'm not, I've never really experienced, I've never played around with it yet. Okay. So. Yeah, I have a little bit. That's why I was curious if you had okay. just from a, yeah. a non- whatever we're talking about right I mean, now. I it's Stanford wild, these channel. large language learning models, like what they can do. I mean, it's wild, you know, it's wild, crazy stuff. So, I mean, what have yeah. you, is it kind of blown your mind when you? Yeah, it does. And I'm, I'm starting to figure out how to use ChatGPT in my daily, you know, not my daily by any means, but using it effectively a little bit more and more like, right, just to give you an example, I'm working on a presentation around mm -hmm. the, the power of accounting in real estate. I mean, at the end of the day, culture and accounting has really allowed us to do what we've done at city life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working on that. And, you know, you just jo go into chat GPT and it's like, I literally will just type in, give me 30 reasons why accounting is incredibly important in real estate. And it literally just drops down 30, 30 bullet point reasons as to exactly why it is. I'm like, perfect. Right now I have my 30. I didn't, now I just go tweak it. Yeah, exactly. Right? At least it's a starting. Yeah. Point it's, it's an least. incredible starting point. Yeah. I'm not good at creating anything from scratch. I mean, yeah, we created City Life from scratch, but not really, right? right? Like, it was one day after the other. And so, like, presentations and, you know, you can ask the marketing team. I'm not good at just coming up with whatever, right? Yeah, and so like, it's, it's starting to become valuable there. Job descriptions for us, right? It's nice because it, it kind of creates a lot of the shell for you, and then you can kind of tweak it to what your company is or whatever, yeah. right, around those things. So we're finding some ways there. Um, you know, the other... Uh, a little bit of AI we're starting to work towards. I know we're starting to do some more research. It's kind of the bots in social media, yeah. right? Like automated answers. There's some really powerful and cool stuff yeah. out there that companies are using. Yeah, I mean, even though we're, I mean, I have like, we could do a whole podcast on like my feelings of like social media and these bots. And I mean, I think it's, there's a lot of positives, but I think we as society have to figure out how to curve some of the negative consequences of uh, social media and things like that. It's, and, you know, it's like that with anything new, you know, you kind of like let it out of the gates. You can't, people aren't seeing around the corners, like what the downsides are. And then it takes a while for like policy and just, you know, everything to catch yeah, up. Yeah, right. So. I mean, that's that, you know, a lot of the very powerful people in the world, Elon Musk, right? A lot of them have actively come out and said like the government needs to stop the development of AI now until they can do exactly what you said, right. which is put some controls around it, really actually understand what's going it's on. It's scary, right? You know, that the, the scare side of it. Things. Yeah, yeah so, for sure. You know, people like Elon and all of the others that, you know, they are involved in worlds of which I have no idea about, right? They're building rockets to the, to the, to outer space, right? So right. if they're saying those things, it's like, we should probably listen. I think so too. I mean, uh, you know, what's the, I mean, there's only so much upside, right? Like it seems like potentially incredible downside. So it seems like, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, maybe the scene off Jurassic Park, the scientists were <laughs> so busy seeing like if they could do it, they what didn't. What a reference. Yeah, bro. <laughs> right. That's old school <laughs> reference. That's the, that's the OG um, well, they're saying, uh, I think, Park, I think they're right? saying if, within, like, if we should do it, right. They're saying in 12, at least within 12 months, right. Albert, and I don't know the IQ, I don't remember, but I listened to a podcast where like Albert Einstein is X, which is the highest known IQ mm -hmm. in a human ever. And these machines are all like, the machines are about there. And within another year, they're going to be significantly ahead of the highest IQ we've ever seen. So like, right. what does that really like? That means something we have no idea what it means yet. I think. Yeah, I think, so. yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, I try not to worry about stuff that's like too much out of my control. Same, but like, what am I going to do? We're I mean, talking about it, so I have, yeah, we have to say no, it, yeah, right? Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. I, I totally agree with you. And it's just like, uh, 
you know, we hope we can get some like leadership in there that can, um, you know, curve these things before we, you know, witness too much, too many of the downsides that can come along with like new technologies. Yeah. 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 So I'll end it there for you. I won't, I won't pick your brain too much. Anyway, okay. Yeah. Right. So I, you know, we're, we're about running out of time here. So I like to kind of end everything with the same couple of questions. Right. But the first really is, you know, incredible, right. Incredible, incredible career journey, investment journey. Right. Like where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah. I mean, we talked a lot about strat, like life strategy. Uh, right. It's, you know, no matter where I say I'm going to be in five years, I like to always be flexible and like ready to change that plan. But, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, a couple bakeries up and running, some more passive real estate investments. And I think in five years, I think the answer is, is I actually right now don't know, but in five years I'd like to know and like to be kind of like on a new, um, kind of like this new journey potentially. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and a lot of that is, uh, you know, just preparing, uh, figuring out what that strategy is going to be, right? Like what's the kind of the next going to be the next thing for me. Yeah. I always say for me, right. My happiness is chasing it. Right. Like I find the most joy every day waking up and trying to figure out what the hell makes me happy. Cause it's always changing for me. Right. And it's like, okay, let's take a massive step every day towards happiness. And I'm realizing like, there's no finish line on happiness. It's the chase that yeah. makes me happy, right? I've always heard, you know, this, uh, I, I, sometimes I read some stuff on like, uh, this guy is a philosopher named like Alan Watts. No oh God. And uh, he <laughs> talks about, you know, you have to be careful like looking at life as like a journey, you know, because you're always, See, I think when you, and what he says is like, think of life as like a dance, right? Like there's no, you're not trying to get to the end of the dance, right? You're enjoying every moment of the dance. And I think yeah. you're basically saying the same thing, right? You're saying that like the, the, the journey is the destination, right? And chasing that happiness, uh, actually the act of chasing the happiness is what's generating the happiness, yeah. right? So. Yeah, I love that. And obviously that's really good advice, but my next question Right is you know so you can't use that one. But, okay, uh, you know what's the best advice you can give somebody right now listening, whether they're entrepreneur in corporate America, thinking about real estate, have nothing to do with it, whatever. What's the best advice you're willing to give somebody right now? Um, I would say like maybe that advice on get uncomfortable or get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? And know that just because you have to trust your instincts, but like no because you're uncomfortable and you're fearful, you know, don't be able to override that and be able to take a leap, right? Like whether it's to open a business, quit your job or something as simple as like have a tough conversation with a friend or your spouse or something, right? Um, challenge yourself like every day to like overcome your fears. And if you start doing, it doesn't have to be these big things. You don't have to quit your job. Right. You can just have an, like a conversation that's a little bit uncomfortable that you're dreading a little bit. And you start doing this like every day and all of a sudden it gets like it doesn't get any easier, but like you get stronger. Right. Yeah. So I would say, uh, you know, think about that and and build on it every day. Just like little incremental steps. I love that, man. Yeah. Appreciate having you. Yeah, it's been really cool. My first podcast, and we, we, I really we, appreciate uh, you having well, me. Well, I won't. I won't say what I was about to say, but yeah, man, we're glad. Glad we could be your your podcast first. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And obviously, looking forward to dinner here with you tonight as well. Yeah, I can't wait. So uh, appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Casey. I appreciate yeah. it.